Hi there, and welcome back to these readings, which are for day number 147. 1 Samuel 16, Psalm 100, and our first session in Romans 6. Yesterday's reading told the story of Saul's incomplete obedience and the rejection of Saul as king by both God and Samuel. In the process, Samuel says some of the most important statements in Scripture, which I will underline here. Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft, and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. And a second quote. He who is the glory of Israel will not lie, nor will he change his mind, for he is not human that he should change his mind. 1 Samuel 16 Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, How can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong? they asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, Surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, This is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shimea. But Samuel said, Neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, This is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. Some of Saul's servants said to him, A tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. Let us find a good musician to play the harp whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you. He will play soothing music and you will soon be well again. Saul said, All right, find me someone who plays well and bring him here. One of the servants said to Saul, One of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. Not only that, he is a brave warrior, a man of war, and has good judgment. He is also a fine-looking young man, and the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse to say, Send me your son David, the shepherd. Jesse responded by sending David to Saul, along with a young goat, a donkey loaded with bread, and a wineskin full of wine. So David went to Saul and began serving him. Saul loved David very much, and David became his armor-bearer. 
Then Saul sent word to Jesse, asking, Please let David remain in my service, for I am very pleased with him. And whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp. Then Saul would feel better, and the tormenting spirit would go away. This psalm probably ranks second in the most memorized psalms, next to Psalm 23. Helping me with the reading today is my son David's family, his wife Jen, and Luke and Laura. Psalm 100, a psalm of thanksgiving. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him, singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever, and his faithfulness continues to each generation. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever, and His faithfulness continues to each generation. Mankind can at best only hope for the kind of partial obedience we have seen in Saul. We can't just try harder to please God. We always fall short of God's glorious standard, as we have heard before in chapter 3. The only hope for us is for God to recreate us. This is done by our understanding and applying a spiritual reality we cannot see, which we will hear about in chapter 6. I'm starting with the last two paragraphs of chapter 5, so that we can hear the transition. Starting at verse 18. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone who believes. Because one man disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other man obeyed God, many will be made righteous. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought death to them, now God's wonderful grace rules instead giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Romans 6. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. 
We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead, and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God. Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I'm using the illustration of slavery to help you understand this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led ever deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do, things that end in eternal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We have a short reading today. I encourage you to take time to think about the spiritual concepts Paul has been talking about in these last chapters, particularly Romans 5 and 6. The way to apply unseen spiritual realities in your life is to ask God to help you fully understand and believe them. And now let's pray together. O Lord our God, may the whole earth shout with joy to you. May the whole world worship you with gladness and come before you with singing and with joy. May all peoples everywhere acknowledge that you are the Lord God who has made them and that we are all your people and the sheep of your pasture. May they enter your gates with thanksgiving because of the knowledge of Christ Jesus who saves them. Father, we thank you for the wonderful things we read in Romans 6. The spiritual realities that are shown there about our position, about our being joined to Christ, are one of the keys to transformed lives and transformed minds. And so we thank you, Lord, for these ideas that we have been joined with Christ, that we who have been baptized have died with him, and that we were raised with him. And now we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will help us to live like Him, 
because we are one with him. That we would avoid entrapment and ensnarement again to the old life that was ours when we were slaves to sin. And we pray that today we would glorify Christ Jesus in our lives.